Shruti, if you want to come up and say a few words. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Elise and Naomi, for having me. Um, I guess I'll say what I can say about Night Garden is that unlike many stories um, and now a novel where I feel like I've really sweated over it, it's just every sentence feels like so much effort, um, this story just appeared to me whole cloth one evening many years ago, actually, and I just sat down and received it. And the longer I work as a writer, the more I realize what a precious and fleeting <laughs> uh, experience that is. I don't think I've actually ever experienced uh, being so fully immersed in a work and listening to it from beginning to end. So um, it's a great privilege to share it with you guys tonight, and I'm excited to hear it aloud from a different voice. Thank you. Okay, is this good? Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Night Garden by Shruti Swami. I heard the barking at 6.30 or 7. It had been a long, hot day, and evening was a relief. I was cooking dinner. I knew Chotu's voice well the bright, happy barking that he threw out in greeting, the little yips of pleading for a treat or a good rubdown, and the rare growl, sitting low and distrustful in his throat when the milkman came around. He was a very friendly dog. This sound, however, was unlike any of those. It was high and held in it a mineral note of panic, I went over to the kitchen window that looked out onto the yard where we had a garden. There was a pomegranate tree, an orange tree, and some thick flowering plants, jasmine and jacaranda, and some I did not know that my husband had planted years before. But I was the one that kept them alive. Chotu stood dead center in the red earth. His tail was taunt and his head level with his spine ears pinned against his skull, so his body arrowed into a straight line, nearly gleaming with the quality of attention. He was not a large dog, black and sweet and fox-like, sometimes shy, with yellow paws and snout. Facing him was a black snake, a cobra, with the head raised and the hood fanned out. I myself let out a cry. The cobra had lifted the front of its body at least two feet from the ground. I had never seen one so close, even separated by four strong walls and a pane of glass. I could see even her delicate tongue darting between her black lips. Her eyes were fixed on the dog and his on hers. Their gaze did not waver. Her body, too, was taunt with attention, shiny back gleaming from the low evening light. The sky I saw now was red, low and red, and the sun a wavering orange in the sky. Of course, my first instinct was to rush out with a broom, screaming and scare the thing off. But something stopped me. I stood for a full minute at the sink, shaking all over. Then I took a deep breath and phoned my sister. There's a cobra outside with Chotu, she exhaled. She was my big sister and had been subject lately to too many of my emergencies. It's okay. Call Dr. Ramathan. He knows about snakes. Do you have his phone number? I did. Are you crying? No. It's okay, Vigi. I can't. Then I stopped myself. Can't what? My sister has a voice she could soften or harden, depending on the circumstance. She kept it soft with me now, like talking to a child. I wiped my face like a child with the bottom of my shirt. I'll call you back, I said. I went again to the window. The animals were still there, exactly where they had been when I last looked. 
The dog had stopped barking, and the cobra looked like a line of poured oil. I dialed Dr. Ramathan's number. Doctor, there's a snake out there with my dog, a cobra, in my yard. A cobra, is it? I could see him in his office, his white hair and furred ears. He had a doctor's gruffness, casual in the most serious of circumstances, and had been both my children through, had seen both my children through countless fevers, stomach upsets, and broken bones. Has it bitten? No, no, they, they haven't even touched each other. They're not even moving, just staring each other down. Don't do anything. Just watch them and stay inside. Nothing? He'll die. I mean, I know, I know he'll die. If you stay inside the house, he won't die. The snake was trying to come inside the house, and he stopped it. Now he is giving all his attention to the snake. If you break that concentration, the snake will kill him, and it will also be very dangerous for you. Are you sure? No one must come in until the snake has left. Tell your husband to stay out until the snake is gone. After I hung up with Dr. Ramonathan, I took a chair and set it by the window so I could sit while I watched the dog and the snake. It was a strange dance. Stranger still because of its soundlessness. The snake would advance, the dog would retreat a few steps. The hair was standing up on the back of his neck like a cat, and now the tail pointed straight up. I could see fear in his face, and his eyes narrowed and his teeth bared. The snake looked in comparison almost peaceful. I didn't hear her hiss. The white symbol glowed on her back, their focus was so completely on the other, I wondered if they were communicating in some way I couldn't hear or understand. Then the dog stood his ground and the snake stopped advancing. She seemed to rise up even higher. There was something too perfect about her movements, which were curving and graceful. Half in love with both, I thought, and it chilled me. Evening came down heavily. The mass of red sky darkened into purple. The phone rang, and it was my sister. Well, they're still there. They've hardly moved. VG, have you eaten? It's getting late. I had been in the middle of making a simple dinner for myself and had, of course, forgotten. The rice was sitting half washed in a bowl next to the sink. I didn't feel hungry, less even than usual. I don't like to eat by myself. Instead, I felt hollow like a clay pot waiting for water. It was pleasant, almost an ache. What time is it? 9.30, darling. Eat something. Shall I come over? No, no, Dr. Ramathan said no one can come in or out. You phone Sushil? What's the point? Well, what if he comes home? He's not coming home. It's his dog, too. My dog. I said that too loudly. He's my dog. Then back to the window. It had grown dark, and I hesitated to turn on the light in the house in case they would startle. Our eyes sharpened as the light faded. There was a bit of light that came in from the street, from the other houses, though it was filtered through the leaves and branches of the fruit trees and the flowers. In it, I could see the eyes of my dog, bright as live coal. There is a depth that dog's eyes have, which snake eyes don't lack. Snake's eyes are flat and uncompromising and reveal none of the animating intelligence. Perhaps that's why we never trust them. Now, very quietly, I could hear the snake hissing. There was a rough edge to it. The dog advanced. The snake seemed to snap her jaws. I have seen a dead snake split open on the side of the road. Its blood was red and the meat looked like meat swarmed with flies. People said it was a bad omen for me, a bride, to see it then. Imagine the wedding of the Orissa bride who married the cobra that lived near the ant hill and was blessed by the village. You know, people make jokes about the wedding night, but everyone's marriage is unknowable from the outside. I saw a picture of her in the newspaper, black hair, startled eyes, and I blessed her too. Who wouldn't? This same communion, it must have been two sets of eyes inextricably locked for hours. The coom coom smeared in her part like blood. The dog was gaining ground. 
He stood proud and erect, still focused, but doggish now, full of a child righteousness. His ears pricked up, but then, for no reason I could discern, the weather between them turned, and it was now the snake who held them both, immense and swaying in her infinite power. Who knows how much time passed? I sat there by the window. The three of us were in a kind of trance. Once I awoke with my head in my arms, I had fallen asleep right there on the lip of the sink. I blinked once and trying to make sense of the kitchen's dark shapes. It seemed as though I had had a dream of a snake and Chotu engaged in a bloodless, endless battle. And when I looked outside, there they were, keeping this long vigil. Their bodies were outlined by moonlight. At this hour, they looked like unearthly gods who had taken the form of animals for cosmic battle. But I could see the fatigue in my dog. You see it with people on their feet for hours, even when they try and hide it. A slump in the shoulders, the loose shoulders of the dead. No different with my dog. He would die. I was sure of it. I pressed this thought against me and the empty house, and I would let all the plants die in the yard, and I would move. I find that at night you can look at your life from a great distance, as though you are a child sitting up in a tree, listening to the meaningless chatter of adults. I stood up in the kitchen, and it had been years since I was up this late. Slowly, infinitely slow, the creatures now were inching back towards the shed at the side of the house, the dog retreating and the snake advancing. Their movements were like the progression of huge clouds that seemed to sit still in the sky, and you marked their advancement only against the landscape. I followed them, moving from one window to the other. I became very angry with Shotu. What arrogance or stupidity had urged him to take on this task? It's easier to be the hero, to leave and let others suffer the consequences. To run barking into the house was all he needed to do to show me the snake so I could close up the doors. I stood. The snake hissed up and made a ducking move forward towards Chotu, who snarled, baring his yellow teeth, doing a delicate move with his paws, shuffled back, weaving like a boxer. He let out three high yelps, pure anger, and snapped his jaws, and the snake rose even higher, flaring out her hood, hissing. I could hear it loudly like a spray of water. Then she lowered herself, back and forth on the ground as she slunk away leaving her belly's imprint on the dirt. I went outside. The air was clean and cool, thin as it hadn't been all day, like it had rained. He was tired. He whimpered when he saw me, his ears pricking up, and pressed his wet snout in my hand as I got close. He was radiant. With his mouth pressed closed between my hands, his eyes looked all over my face, joyful and humble the way dogs do and are filled with gladness. He swayed on his feet with fatigue, then slumped down to his knees in a dead faint, tongue lolling back. His breathing came out slow and easy. Who had death come for that night, the dog or I? I lifted the sleeping creature in my arms. He was no heavier than one of my children when they were young and I took them in my arms to bed. The air was very still outside at this time of night, or morning. Hardly any sounds came from the street, and all the lights were off in the neighboring houses. The air rushed in and out of Chotu's body, his lungs and snout. What you have left is what you have left. I carried him back into the house. <laughs>